Hello and welcome to the Multifamily Investing Academy podcast. I am your host, Charles Dobbins, here with another edition of my award-winning podcast. And this week, I have two of my clients who are killing it. Uh, and they're going to talk about their fund that they're putting together for the great things they're doing out in Western Mass. And they're going to share with you their story about how they got started. Uh, they got started right before COVID. They were clients of mine, and now they are killing it. I love hearing these stories. Two of the best guys going. So um, sit back, enjoy this rendition of the Multifamily Investing Academy podcast. I mean, you guys look at, I have, you're the only appointment on my calendar today. I got. A, I put a coat and tie on for you. Uh, I'm all decked out. Uh, so you make this good. You better make this good. I'll tell you that right now. So, you really know how to make a guy feel good. Yeah, look at you with matching hoodies. You, know, you look like. Are they you matching? Like you guys could be senators from Pennsylvania for crying out loud. The way you dress. Uh, I'm a, actually. Well, yeah. Well, look, oh, look at yeah, we're getting the whole body shot yeah, there. We got that. Yeah, we, yeah. He's just trying to show us his. I'm his changing chest into my tat. work. It's, and the thing is, he got the chest tattoo, and he cried the whole way through when they had to when they had to uh, take the hair off his chest. You should no, see his cock. He did. He did. <laughs> you know, they put uh, they, they have a new rule in my country club: no hoodies are allowed in the dining room because guys are trying to dress like the the senator from Pennsylvania. <laughs> <laughs> So bad. <laughs> so bad. So what's going on, you guys? You killing it or what? Hey, we're working hard. That's for sure. Yeah, no kidding. But that it is. It's hard work. I just I was talking to one of my students. I don't know if you remember John Fisher. Uh, he was from he was from Dorchester. Funny, funny bastard. And uh, he was in my program. I helped him buy his first property. He's up to about thirty units now. He and his wife are running them down in uh, Rhode Island. And and you know he bought them at six hundred bucks a month rent, and they're up to thirteen hundred bucks a month rent now. So he's in that regard, he's doing it. But he is boots on the ground, hands you know, hand getting his hands dirty uh, in the business, which you know I don't have any problem with it. You gotta you gotta work hard in this business to make it work. Yeah, I definitely don't think this is uh, this is not the business for you to sit and try to actually passively. That doesn't work. And when you said that in. Uh, when when we were just getting started with your coaching program and you said something along the lines of nobody will take care of your baby like you will yeah um we, we we've ran with that and we actually we got beat up in 2017 18 by some bad general contractors in boston doing yeah. more like flips and condo deals and um because of that experience we actually we became general contractors we got yep. harrison license we got insurance and We've I been, just we've, John, that was one thing that John said. He says, "I'm I own the property management company now." Yep. 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 Same thing. Same thing yep. here. So we're we're super boots on the grounds as well out here. We're closing on our 16th building this month, uh, and so I think cool. that puts us up to like about 160 units out here. That is so cool. That is so awesome. Because you know what? When I was first getting started in this, like back in 2000, when I knew I wanted to get into apartments, but I was still running that god awful insurance firm, you know. The way that we would find deals back in that day was on the Sunday Boston Globe. That's where you would see, you know, some ads. And they always had dirt cheap property out in Chicopee, out in, you know, uh, in a Western Mass. Um, and I'm thinking, yeah, but I don't want to go all the way out there. But you guys said, well, you know, let's get ahead of the ahead of the curve here and head out to Western Mass. And you did it. We, we actually did, we did beat a bit of the curve. I mean, we've got wind development that just broke ground two blocks away from six of our buildings. And so to have an institutional guy come into the market now, uh, and then three months ago, Harrison, another, uh, a very large project with a large residential value add component just traded for $12 million here in downtown. So it's, um we're excited because we've gotten into a lot of these buildings somewhere between 30 to 55,000 a unit on the acquisition and um you know those those big in, those big institutional guys kind of paved the way for the increase in values yeah. and uh just based on some reporting I've seen like and what they're publishing you know they're looking they're projecting $460,000 valuations on these new units coming to downtown and wow. um that sounds crazy but they did it in um you know they did it in Lynn and uh you know they they hit their numbers very similar projects very similar ecosystems so yeah we're i told harrison three and a half years ago i said i either found our honeypot or we're gonna go bankrupt <laughs> yeah 
that's like me with the hotels to apartments. Like that's that's my honeypot too. And you know, I'm like, I know what you mean about going bankrupt. Like, oh, all my money is out right now. Like, I was supposed to keep some powder dry. I'm like, I, I, I'm I'm here and I'm there. Like, come on, let's let's turn this stuff. So yeah. man, I know how you feel. I know how you feel. Yeah, it's we've it's definitely been a different market. You know, for sure, we we experienced different issues and challenges that you know uh, the Avalons and a lot of these B class realtor real estate guys. You know, the A and B guys just don't see, but we've, you know, I've Harrison now lives about 50 minutes away from Holyoke. I moved, I live full time here. So I'm now eight minutes away from the portfolio. Uh, um, and you guys are out there with the all the women in, in comfortable shoes. You know, <laughs> <laughs> we do have a lot of hiking. <laughs> wow. Yeah. Do you have, are you driving a green Subaru wagon yet? No, I still oh, I have man. a I have a I still have a convertible rear wheel drive Mustang. I'm just you know I've had a Camaro <laughs> here. I st- got rid of the Camaro, got a Mustang. I'm definitely not one for uh, work trucks or. Uh, practical oh, we're gonna vehicles. get you. Gonna, gonna get uh, you in the uh, the green Subaru wagon with uh, Vermont license plates because that's what you know everybody out there drives for crying out loud. <laughs> That's how you get stopped by the police out here. Yeah, because well, of course, <laughs> come through on the Vermont plates. <laughs> I know, but the thing is, if you're driving a Subaru, you're the worst driver on the road, so you're going to get pulled over anyway. So, what? <laughs> if this, if this wasn't being recorded, I would take it to the next level. <laughs> so, all right. So, what's going on? Are you doing this thing with a fun? What, what's this? What's the deal? Yeah, Harrison, you want to uh, you want to tackle this? Sure. Um, I mean, about the fund in general, I'm not sure. I'm not exactly sure where we left off this conversation, like before this, you know what I mean? Well, Um, I I understood it might be some way that either we work with you in the fund, we get involved or you lend us or or something to that effect. So, well, I guess in general, you know, from a high level, like, you know, perspective of our business and where we are, like we're very much like we have a good portion of our portfolio that's in more of like a stabilized position, but also like a huge percentage, it's almost 50, 50 is still in value add. Um, and as you know, a lot of these deals and, and higher lift projects can take you know, like a lot longer to come to fruition than you may hope or plan, or just in general, they take a while to oh, yeah. So it's so, twice as much money and twice as much time. Exactly. So yep. we're basically, we're essentially always raising capital. Now, depending on the day or week or month might depend on what we're raising that capital for. Um, but we're always raising capital and we're always looking for efficient ways to do that efficient, you know, efficient structuring or attractive structuring uh, for prospective investors um, or, um, you know, scale efficiencies at capital raising so that we're not like always scrambling, 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 scrambling. Um, you know, figuring like it's like you know Tuesday, and we're like, okay, we got to figure out some shit by Friday, and then by next Friday, we got to like have like another hundred grand figured out. Like that's just like obviously totally unsustainable. And like Alex likes to say this, it's just totally true. If you had all the money in the world, or in this, or in our, or like to be more specific, if you just had all the, if you had all the cash that you needed to run any project, it would be the most, it would be the easiest business in the world. Yeah, no um, and you never, you never lose money, right? <laughs> um, but you know that is pretty much not the case for anyone so by nature you have to be good at raising capital you have to be a good salesperson you have to be a good operator you have to be good at all these things in the well, business i'm gonna i'm gonna write that last line down because that might be my next podcast <laughs> it's so true yeah. if we did all, if we used 100 percent cash on everything we ever did we would have never lost money we'd be you know multi-millionaires <laughs> We're already um, multi-millionaires on paper. Yeah, He's really on the trials. You know, that's to be true. honest, and I don't you, mean we started. Time. We started with you. Uh, you know, it is it is funny because sometimes you can get lost in the day to day grind because we do everything. We do everything from you know we're very involved in the legal side. We're there on the marketing and the lease up. We're there on the management. We're there on the repairs and maintenance. We're there on the investor relations. So it can be hard to you know, uh, sometimes, you know, keep it uh, light and daisy. But truthfully, Charles, it's crazy. You know, we effectively started with you right before COVID. And then we bought our first building. And then two months later, COVID. And then we've grown our entire portfolio and exited uh, a, a couple a couple million dollars worth of development in Boston. And we've done it all. And we've done it all in COVID rate hikes and some craziness. And, um, 
you know, we're, we're, we're crushing the equity now, you know, but yeah. between the two of us, you know, we've got, we've got about four and a half to 5 million uh, on, on the, on the balance sheet, which is yeah. great and awesome. But, you know, our biggest challenge now is, um, you know, we're seeing the value, but because of the interest rates and some of these new loans, the debt service coverage and the, and the loan mounts are getting smaller. So, yes. you, you know, you budget, you buy something for 40 cents on the dollar, you spend 25 cents on the dollar, fixing it up, you know, you account for 5% in interest, you know, that's your 70% LTV. Um, and, you know, we just, we bought a building two and a half years ago, one, three, it just appraised for three, three, um, which is great. It's awesome. But, you know, we're not, we're not able to crush those 70, 75% LTVs at, at 3% interest anymore. Right. So it's just, uh, it's another cog in the wheel that makes you say, okay, it is. how do you, how do you figure out, you know, you've got the value, you need an, ed you need an educated investor that understands this and isn't yep. terrified that their money is sitting in this project for, you know, you know, if, if we're a hundred short on a refi, but we have a million and a half dollars in equity, we right. don't need to be trying to talk that investor down off a ledge when they're yeah. secured by something with so much equity. So yeah, it's, you know, we're just kind of at this natural growth where, um, you know, a bit of sophistication is required and it's needed to scale and, and, and operate efficiently. And uh, so that's really where the fund came. You know, we've, we just set up the Wallace and Wealth Foundation or no, not the foundation. I'm sorry. The Wallace and what's it called, Harrison? The, the new one is the wall. So originally it was called the Wallace and Wealth Fund. Um, we probably hired an attorney. We, that wasn't, she wasn't super helpful. We ended up having to hire a new firm and revamp the loan documents and, or like the whole fund documents. And they recommended slightly changing the name, but anyway, now it's the Wallace and wealth management fund. Nice. So yeah, that's uh, basically what we're looking now to do is we've got some projects, Charles, that are, you know, ready to get some capital injections to, to see the, the future of this equity out. And, um, we opened up now a $10 million fund. Our goal is to uh, raise cash that we need to see this next leg of development through. Um, well, we've got about, we've, we own a $28 million portfolio that we're actively developing. So our goal is to reposition our private investment, uh, or a, a good portion of it, um, to a 36 month term timeline so we can see the value of all these developments we have in our pipeline. Uh, and then a bit of that is also capital raised to, you know, get those projects across the line. Um, but all in all, with the fund and the, the capital that we have, you know, we're looking we're we're floating in that like 65 uh, percent leverage uh, against the future value. So we're in a great spot. And now we just need to, uh, you know, get larger, more sophisticated investors. So we're not spending, you know, our day to day operations trying to raise and replace somebody smaller. Okay, now you guys also have a, you know, when you were on my uh, live call, uh, you guys had a really cool offering memorandum, a real cool PPM package. I mean, that was beautiful. So how can people get their hands on that? Yeah, absolutely. A best way would be to to reach out to Harrison and myself directly. Uh, we've made some tweaks to that, uh, that, that offering, um, uh, that offering advertising material, but Alex at Wollaston REI, that's A-L-E-X at W-O-L-L-A-S-T-O-N-R-E-I.com. And then it's Harrison at the same address. That's H-A-R-R-I-S-O-N. Uh, and we'd be happy to set up a informational call, you know, do a portfolio tour if anybody likes. And uh, from there, we can do a bit more of a deep dive. And the thing is, those, I mean, when I was looking at that, that um, PPM, those, uh, I mean, the properties, I, they were the classic, beautiful old buildings that you guys got your hands on for pennies on the dollar and are turning them into this, this uh, you know, beautiful apartment building. We're seeing that here in Manchester, New Hampshire. We're seeing it here in Nashua. Uh, I, you know, I just love what you guys are doing. I, I had a, um, there's a, there's a young guy here in New Hampshire, just like you, it reminds me of you guys. And he just uh, um, got approved a 260-unit apartment uh, uh, ground-up construction here in downtown Nashville, New Hampshire. And let me tell you, about six years ago, he was flipping homes, but he he took it the same way you guys did. He he you know he went out into the business with his brother. He slept on his brother's couch while they built this whole thing up. They did it like you you know like every new business owner starts their business. And it's so great to hear you guys are killing it now. That is great. 
So what's a big dream for you? What's the big goal? Where do you see yourself? Because like, you know, there's a, another apartment complex that, here that was an old mill building owned by a company called Sullivan, uh, Brady Sullivan Properties. You might see it when you drive through New Hampshire. They have the high, the tallest building in New Hampshire is Sullivan Brady or Brady Sullivan, or whatever it is on the top there. These are two guys that started just like you, you know, 20 years ago, and now they own everything. So where do you guys see, you got, you see yourself going? Well, I'll let Harrison answer his own, but I mean, we've been, we've been pretty dead uh, steady since day one that we want to change the city skyline and, and put a big tower up one day. Oh, you know, that's, wow, that is so cool. That's, that's ultimately where we want to go. I mean, I, I, I kind of live and ooze that persona just on my Instagram and on my Facebook, it says like, take me to the top floor. And it's just, yeah. you know, I want to live in, I want to live in a penthouse and a big building that we put up one day. That's so cool. <laughs> So, yeah, because yeah, right now the uh, the highest building in Springfield, I think, is almost uh, 50 years old, for crying out loud. I remember going there when I was in the insurance business. So, yeah, let's go see the uh, – uh, well, let, we won't call it the Ch Chocala or, or, you know, Bonner might be an easy name. <laughs> we'll call it the Bonner, uh, you know, the Bonner thing, yeah. Just call it the big Bonner. Bonner and you can Alexander see Bonner, <laughs> you know. That was like that was like my, my buddy uh, – John, who I mentioned at the beginning of the, of the show, um, he, he puts he puts all his uh, he puts all his uh, eviction notices and what have you, and it's uh, addressed to um, it's addressed to Robert Hemingway, and uh, he had his wife's dog's name was Bob, and his his dog's name was Hemingway. So now they everybody gets a, a letter from their dogs. To <laughs> That's all. Awesome. So, you know, you guys take Alexander Bonner, Harrison, Alexander Harrison. That's it. Look, if I take Harrison's last name, I'm I'm making sure that the lights on the second end don't work. That way, you can see that big photo <laughs> from the highway. Exactly. Yeah, exactly. Oh, <laughs> that is bad. That is yeah. bad. We've never changed. Like we oh, just exactly. never changed. And I and I've and I've said this too. It'll be interesting as we get into you know family offices and RIA groups. But like you know, this is the this is the quality of conversation we have with pretty much everybody that works with us. Uh, yeah. And it's a uh, it's 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 a good culture for the most part. <laughs> and, and one of the cool things, but before, but for the people that are, are listening to this without the benefit of a video, uh, just to remind you that uh, Harrison's last name is Bonner with two N's. Uh, and just uh, you, you, you folks do the math at home, okay? You do the math. <laughs> I've heard it my whole life. So. Yeah, exactly. At some point, you just you probably to you probably had to explain it to Alexander at one time because he wouldn't have figured it out. Um, That's Harry. His phone is Harrison Bonnet for the longest time. Bonnet. <laughs> right, you know, one of the cool things that you guys have done that uh, you know is is visionary, and I think people who are you know starting out and want, see themselves like becoming what you guys are doing. One of the things that you did is you became very friendly with the city fathers out there in those towns. And, you know, you're known, uh, which one of the huge benefits to that is when they have a problem, they come to see you. When they have a problem property, now they come to see you. So talk a, a little bit about that relationship. Yeah. Um, actually, this is something that um, I have really enjoyed moving over into Western Mass. Um and being able to do this. Cause you know, when Harrison and I were doing, you know, we had three projects in Chelsea, right? Uh, great, you know, three great projects, all money makers and um, you know, young guys working in the city, that's exciting stuff. But when you're just doing a three family next to a three family and, or maybe one around the corner, you're building something, you're not really getting, there's no real impact to the community at, at minimum. You're probably just be called, you know, you're just called that gentrifier. And then, uh, people either love or hate you for what you're doing to the neighborhood. Here, we've been able to uh, kind of take a different approach because now, you know, our money goes so much farther in Western Massachusetts. So a million dollars is buying you a lot more. Um, and then, you know, you're buying these small communities effectively of 10 to 30 families that live there. Um, and, you know, the decisions you, the decisions and the the way you characterize yourself and, and handle yourself, uh, you know, it ripples throughout the community when you're not just building something with the intention to sell it immediately. You're now serving an actual community of, of people. 
So um, as developers coming from Boston and we were used to doing much more, uh, you know, kind of high end furnished projects coming into these neighborhoods and saying, how do we, how do we reactivate the space? How do we revitalize the building without stripping it of the neighborhood character or just displacing everybody? And that is, that's actually really, really hard to do. Um, and, you know, obviously, you know, no one gets to live for free. You have to work with people. You have to do the evictions you have to do. But by and large, we've, we've started to look at our projects uh, from much more sustainable um, values. You know, what is, what is the market rate rent with some type of subsidy assistance that we know we can generate? And then we take those numbers and we reverse it back. So it's kind of like taking your ARV, but now we just figure out what could be our income if we were actually helping somebody that needed clean, suitable housing and maybe couldn't afford it on their own. So we, we reverse engineer back. What is our you know, net operating income going to be? How much money do we need to put in CapEx? And that creates our, that creates our purchase price. And now as you start getting into these larger projects, the most exciting thing is, you know, you're looking at the, the meat and potatoes, what's the rent, what's the expenses, what's my bottom line. But a lot of these buildings come with some form of opportunity to create like uh, a community impact, uh, typically in the commercial spaces. Um, so when you're underwriting, how do I maximize the value of, of this business? Um, we have found in, in, in many certain cases, the highest and best use for the space is actually a business that we can be a part owner in with another operator and we can fill a need inside our own community. So for example, um, one of our buildings on Main Street has 12 apartments and we've got three buildings directly behind that that have 29 apartments and we have two buildings just down the road that have 13 apartments. None of our tenants are allowed to have washing machines in their units because they flood and they leak and that's annoying. And there's no laundry mat in the neighborhood. So- oh, Looking at, you know, we bought a building that had 12 residential apartments, the 12 residential apartments, pencil all by themselves, the deal, we don't need the commercial space. So now we say, how do we, you know, the bar is set very low to make the commercial space win um, and you get creative. So we found a laundromat, um, two laundromats that were going out of business over in Brookline and Boston, bought all their stuff, put it in there. Um, and it's, it's not ready yet, but now there's, you know, that's going to be a little bit of its own cash cow and it's going to serve our existing tenant base. So it's fun because at scale, you get to think of creative ideas like that for your business. Too funny. So, all right. Now, no, I was just thinking that the other day because we were talking on uh, one of the properties we're looking at, we're going to need a washer dryer arrangement. And I was, I, so I contacted uh, one of these national washer dryer firms. I said, I thought to myself, what if I just go rent the space? And then they come and they put in all, all the machines and, you know, they get like with my multifamily properties, they give me a decoration fee for setting it up and they just let the thing run. And I'll just, you know, I just sign my name on the, on the commercial space and they run all the operations. I just keep, you know, 50, uh, 50, 40, to 50% of the revenue. I thought, wow, that's, that's a pretty good deal. I might want to try something like that, especially if, if I own the commercial space. So. Yeah, and if you don't have to do, and if you don't have to run it, you know, we've, uh, yeah. af and it was kind of interesting because we went the exact opposite direction of trying to get rid of responsibility. We took on all the responsibility. Uh, uh, that way we could maintain control. Um, but that's also come with benefits of scale. You know, now we've got seven guys that are working for us full time. So you talk about a repair and maintenance submission that comes through a tenant. And it's like, you know, we can we can crush that level of, of service. And, you know, when we talk about putting new businesses in, we've already got this team that can help, you know, clean it, change the lint traps, you know, empty yeah. the quarter draws. This can just be part of the rotation. Exactly. Yeah. Very cool. Very cool. All right, guys, you're killing it, man. I mean, that that is I can't wait to see that new. Uh, It'll look like the Trans America building from San Francisco out there in Springfield, Mass. It'll be its own its own strange design, you know. And it's just uh, it's just a uh, a monument to the two of you and what you've created. So, all right. So, listen. How can give it to me again? Because I want people to see your 
your offering memorandum. I, I want them to see your PPM. It is such a, a and, and folks, let me tell you something. If you're looking for something on the ground floor going up, this is it. So make sure you uh, you go to, uh, it's the Wallison Wealth, Man Wealth Management Fund. And uh, you can just email alex at wallaston.com or harrison at, at wall wallaston. Wallaston.com is W-O-L-L-A-S-T-O-N. That was the neighborhood in uh in Quincy or wherever it is where they uh where they met. Uh yes. and, you know, that where their girlfriends uh you know uh, were were uh you know in a sewing group together and that's how they these two came together. That's what it was. You know, <laughs> I, I wish I, I hey, listen, don't let the truth get in the way of a good story. I like my story better. So <laughs> yeah, what so you got it 90% correct. It's Wallaston. Okay. REI.com. Okay. Wallace and REI.com. Great. Got to yep. add that. And then, yep. and you can email Alex at Wallace and REI or <laughs> Harrison at Wallace and REI.com. Uh, and um, yeah, we'd be happy to send all that information and, and share a bit more. And hopefully the next time that we get on the call and do this, uh, Harrison will have been to your pad and, uh, you know, maybe helped you decorate a little bit because, uh, you know, <laughs> something on the walls for crying out loud, Alex. I mean, look at Harrison. He's got the built-ins and, you know, yeah, obviously got that from Ikea. And he just you know, put them together one Sunday afternoon watching the football game. And now look no, at his him. Is look his is his is he's got a historical he's got an old one that was picked up and moved. He's got a really cool old colonial. Oh cool. Oh really? Was it, is that what happened? They moved the colonial? Did you Yeah, it was no, I didn't move it. It was moved in the eighties. So it's got some um all the infrastructure like the interior like like building infrastructure was redone around then. So yeah. some like a new foundation and yeah. it's got a, yeah. a mixture of some newer forty year old new elements. Uh, cool. as well as like a lot of the, all the historical charms. So very cool. And look at you got that target lamp, uh, Alex, you know, right. Well, you know. For the record, let's not hate on this target lamp. And secondly, this is an office. My house is currently being uh, full blown renovations happening inside. This is not the best time of the year to not have insulation or heat, but oh we're, uh, we're getting through it. It's okay. Good. Good. I hope you don't have any kids in that uh, house. Nope. Just me. Okay. All right. Good. All right, guys. Hey, so great to see you. Thank you so much for for uh, coming here and telling me about your what you're what you've been up to. It's so great to hear those, these success stories, and I so want to see that that fun do well. I think that that'll be a, a lot of fun for you. So, excellent job, outstanding, bravo. Thanks for thanks for being on my show. Thank you. Thanks, Charles. <laughs> that's that's fun. All right. That's all the time we have for this week. Uh, thanks for tuning in. We'll be back. In fact, you can expect new episodes every week and sometimes more than one episode a week. Uh, and if you like a complimentary copy of my book, How to Own a Thousand Apartments in Five Years, just uh, go to multifamilyos.com uh, and uh, fill in the box and we, I'll make sure that my staff gets you uh, one of those. And a quick reminder again on how you can support the podcast, make sure you click subscribe and smash that like button because that really helps us move this podcast up. Um, and if you'd like to check out my YouTube channel, it's uh, youtube.com forward slash multifamily investing academy. And we do a Thursday afternoon, 3 p.m. Eastern time, every Thursday live YouTube live call where I talk about anything and everything related to multifamily. So take care, everyone. And until next time, remember what the most most uh, successful multifamily insurance, multifamily investing guru and in the insurance business too, um, always says, if you're not making offers, this is nothing more than a very expensive hobby. And I am out.